Okay, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mark Stockham. I'm a global architect with uh, Dell Technologies, specifically working with uh, VMware Data Protection Solutions. Today, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, how we go about detecting those workloads that are running on Kubernetes, which if you've uh, been paying attention to back Pat Gelsinger's uh, uh, keynote earlier on, you'll know is pretty top of mind for a lot of the, uh, the VMware teams due to things like Project Pacific and, uh, and just general uh, uptake in Kubernetes itself. So what we're trying to address here are uh, two use cases. The, the use case of the Kubernetes administrator. So the Kubernetes administrator or, or the developer is quite often just trying to develop and get the content out as fast as possible. They're iterating fast. They're generally not too uh, concerned with the, uh, the IT ops side of things, you know, the, the compliance, the, the rigor that generally goes into the, the tasks of an IT admin or a data protection admin. And then, of course, you've got the traditional administrator running the data protection side of things or, or the vAdmin, uh, and they are obviously interested in being compliant and making sure that everything's protected, et cetera, et cetera. So we're trying to address the needs of both sides here, both the Kubernetes developer who wants to get the code out and the uh, administrator, the administrator who wants to make sure things are protected correctly. Now, the way that we've done this, we've leveraged some uh, acquisitions that VMware's made in terms of Heptio. So Heptio was acquired earlier on in the year. Uh, Heptio had a project called Arc. The Arc project has been um, rebranded uh, re as Valero. And what we've done is we've taken the Valero project, an open source project that we're able to, to interact with, work with some of the VMware uh, uh, teams in terms of development, and we're now looking at how we can take that solution and wrap uh, an enterprise data protection solution around it. So the top end, the, uh, the front end, is PowerProtect Data Manager which is a solution that has been released this year for protecting workloads both virtual, physical, and, and application-centric. Kubernetes to be added very shortly. And at the back end, both S3 storage, as you'd expect in the cloud, S3 storage or, or, or storage that's available from, uh, from Dell Technologies, as well as uh, data domain. So if you're familiar with data domain, the deduplication capabilities that uh, data domain brings to market. So. What this means is we've got a, a vast number of PowerProtect use cases and a, a vast number of capabilities that PowerProtect brings to the market. What we're specifically looking at here is the cloud native applications, the, the Kubernetes capability. It does offer backup restore for tr traditional workloads. It does offer business continuity, DR, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not gonna read the whole slide, but you can see what we can offer there. Kubernetes being just that next step. Obviously, we're looking to use a single platform to protect all of these workloads. So not just Kubernetes, but also virtual and physical. And with that, we're able to offer a number of consumption choices. We have the uh, multi-dimensional appliances. If you go and visit the, the booth, we have X400s. So we have the ability to add additional modules, additional blocks as you want to scale up. They're also able to be scaled in terms of the internal capacity. If you want to go down that route, everything's in one box. If you want to take the software approach, we're able to use PowerProtect Data Manager, the software, as well as a software-defined data domain, for example. That's an option. And software as a service solution will be, uh, will be with us soon. So a number of ways you can actually deploy PowerProtect, a number of ways you're going to be able to get access to the protection capabilities within Kubernetes. Again, a number of facilities that we're going to be offering with the, with the solution. But the key points here relate to the fact that it's built on top of Kubernetes, leveraging the APIs, not using sidecars, sidecars being a, an inefficient way of protecting uh, Kubernetes uh, containers, and protecting all of those Kubernetes resources by virtue of being able to discover. So discovery and the API-centric side of things, pretty critical here. Not going to dive into great detail around the architecture here. Suffice it to say that not only are we able to you know, work with the uh, with the, in this case, MySQL uh, as the application to be protected. But if you look down the, uh, the middle of the screen there, the PowerProtect namespace, we're able to use the data movers to move data not only to S3 buckets, either on-prem using something like uh, ECS or into the cloud using Amazon's uh, S3 protocol, but also using uh, the, the Dell EMC technologies that I mentioned just now. So an, a data domain, a more traditional data domain, perhaps standalone, or a PowerProtect appliance, should that be the, the method you go through. If, if you're using just S3, you don't get the deduplication benefit. If you're going using DD Boost, obviously, you're going to get that de uh, deduplication and the, uh, and the, 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 the deduplication and the, the minimization of network traffic that comes with. 
The other points to point out on the, the, the far hand, uh, right hand side of the screen is you know, we're able to give visibility and capability to those Kubernetes developers. So we're able to uh, let them access things through the API. We're able to give access to the PowerProtect admin through the PowerProtect software. And obviously, the vSphere admin is going to want access there as well. Coming in the uh, not too distant future, we're going to be linking in with Tanzu Mission Control as well, uh, for those of you that have been following that, that path. So with that, the PowerPoint finishes. And I'm just going to flip across into the demo. So there we go. So what you can see in front of you at the moment is the PowerProtect Data Manager user interface. So this is the, uh, the HTML5 web UI that PowerProtect presents. It's what you'll see if you're protecting virtual machines, physical machines right now with the current release. But if we click on the infrastructure tab here and go into our asset view, what you won't see with the current release coming soon is the Kubernetes uh, view of the world. So we're able to take a Kubernetes cluster, which we'll click on right now, if we've got access to Kubernetes, if we're accessing it through the Kubernetes API, we're able to add uh, the, the Kubernetes uh, pod in this case. So we click on this view here. We click on the pod. We enter Kubernetes demo pod. We verify that that pod exists and that we're able to interact with it. We click on Save. We then go into the, uh, into the storage view, and we're able to, to add a policy that will protect that Kubernetes workload. So. In this case, we're going to give it a name. We're going to select the Kubernetes PVC. Obviously, we've got other virtual machines, et cetera, that I mentioned earlier on, SQL databases. In this case, the Kubernetes PVC is that which will be coming soon. And it's off the bottom of the screen. Give me two seconds. Demos, and there we go. The demos never quote quite to plan, do they? When we click Next. We're able to offer crash consistency for these per uh, persistent volumes. We're also, in the case of MySQL, able to offer an application consistent uh, option. In this case, just crash consistency. And then if we go in and zoom in and click on that particular PVC, that particular asset, we're able to go in and uh, view what policies are, have been applied to that pod. So in this case, it's a bit of an eye test for you. You can see that there's an every four hours copy policy in place. You can see how long we're going to keep it for. You define those policies. You apply them to the containers. The containers are discovered. You're able to treat this just like any other workload. And those persistent volumes can be protected. So if we click on Next here, again, gives us the option to go in and edit those, uh, those, uh, those policies. Gives us a summary view, which we're now going to finish. So what we've done here is still not getting everything I need on the screen. One second. So what we've done is cr create that policy. That policy has been applied. What we're now going to do is go into the command line and start to uh, look at what happens when we delete uh, said pod. So let's go in and delete that, uh, that CSI PVC. You can see, deleted. We're going to go and double check. So we're going to do a get PVC. As you can see, that we should have had five options in there. Now only got four. That, uh, that item has been deleted. We've proved that it's been deleted. What we can do from the command line is look at the restore YAML. So in this case, it's giving us a view as to which uh, YAML file is going to be used to carry out that, uh, that restore process. And we're going to apply it. So we hit Apply Restore. You can now see that that CSI PVC has been recreated. If we do a cube control get, you'll see we have five options, as before. Uh, so we've got that CSI PVC has been restored, and all is good with the world. We've been able to take that uh, PVC. It's been deleted. We're able to go in through the, uh, through the command line, in this case, carry out a backup and restore. And if just to prove things are, are still working from a, a graphical user interface perspective, that CSI PVC now exists back in the UI, as well as being visible through the command line. So as I mentioned earlier on, the user interface tends to be more accessible by the data protection admins, by the virtual admins. But a lot of the, uh, the guys that are working with containers natively will probably want to go in from the, the command line. So we need to make sure that we address both of those use cases for them. So obviously, this is for persistent volumes. Um, but what we're finding is persistent volumes tend to be about 70% of those, uh, of those uh, containers that we see out in the wild right now. The, the more transient, you know, the, the, the ephemeral type uh, Kubernetes uh, containers, obviously you have a different method for reinstantiating those because they don't have persistent data involved. 
So what I'm going to do now is, is wrap up. I've, I've, I've finished the presentation. If you do want to have any further conversations, I am over at the, the booth, as are some of our software and, and hardware appliances. Unless there are any questions, uh, thank you very much for your time.